Hello, everyone. I am Giulio Prisco for this episode of the Turing Church podcast. I am uh, in conversation with Derek uh, Schwelen. Did I pronounce your, ni- your name right first? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so since I understand that you have a few interesting things to discuss, I'll just uh, give the floor to you right away. Sure. Um, well, yeah, first of all, just to introduce myself a little bit, um, you know, my name is Derek, and I think we met through uh, TerraSAM kind of activities, and I've really enjoyed your hosting of the colloquiums and kind of discovered the Turing Church, like, through the, those channels. Um, yeah, and, and I've enjoyed watching your, like, recent podcasts. Um, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to ask you, like, what is your inspiration been for starting these podcasts and and maybe what have you kind of um, what's your experience been so far with all these conversations with all these different people from a variety of backgrounds first i'll have to say all this uh doing podcasts doesn't come very naturally to me i am very much uh, in love with uh, the written word in fact, I do enjoy writing much more. Uh, I, started do, I started doing podcasts because some time ago I realized that uh, for some reason that I'm really unable to understand, many people like to listen more than reading. And uh, that, um, again, is a completely foreign thing to me that, you know, uh, we are different people. And I understand that uh, uh, this format is more convenient uh, for many people and then here I am and so since uh, yeah. I had a whole bunch of uh, people that I wanted to talk to in preparation uh, of uh, my next book then uh, I thought okay let's make this uh, public so that uh, also others can listen uh, and uh, in parallel you know uh, I have this idea of holding uh, periodic uh, Turing Church meetings. And also that uh, is uh, an input channel for these podcasts. And if you have been listening to some, you see that, you know, I don't, uh, um, I don't really pay too much attention to presentation and music and thing. I just uh, don't yeah. have the uh, don't have the time. I don't have the inclination. I don't, don't have the skills for that. So these are just intellectual conversations, and uh, I hope uh, some people will uh, take uh, something good out of them. Yeah, um, personally, I'm, I'm really enjoying them. I, it's really cool. Um, and so I have so many questions to ask you. Um, just regarding your like way of thinking, um, your kind of mm, philosophical inclinations, um, some ideas about uh, uh, cosmism, uh, some ideas about the origins of the Turing Church, and some other more like, I don't know, specific questions. Um, but where did it all, all begin? How, how did you, um, yeah, what's the origin story of your kind of interest in these kind of subjects about space and technology and uh, these kind of things that could fit into futurism, quote, quote, um, yeah. You know, thing, um, I don't, um, I don't even remember that because I have always been interested in these things since uh, I can't remember. Um, I will just share one origin story. I must yeah. have been like uh, six, seven, something like that. And I was on the beach with my mom, and uh, my mom wanted to lay in the sun, and I was making noise. So my mom gave me a science fiction book. She was a very avid science fiction reader. And, uh, you know, uh, it so happened that the book she gave me, that she had finished reading, uh, I believe, the day before, was uh, uh, Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke, one of the masterpieces okay. of science fiction. And oh my God, I was hooked for life. So um, 
No, I always had the ideas that I have been uh, elaborating and writing in the last few years. Mm, like, um, like you know, like a fish in the water. I cannot say that uh, I was uh, persuaded by this and by that. Of course, uh, I have been reading a lot, but it's always like, uh, Okay, I think this interesting thing, let's uh, see who else thought something similar before. Yeah. And uh, of course I couldn't do that that good when I was uh, younger because we didn't have the internet. But you know, now I spend a lot of time like that. They think of something nice and they see whether uh, others have been elaborating on it. Uh, most of the times, of course, is a is a fruitless search because I uh, reading and reading I realized that the idea perhaps was not that good to begin with but uh, quite often I do find um, the works of uh, people who have been elaborating uh, in much detail the same idea and that is good because I'm not very focused on details. Mm, I wouldn't have the patience to elaborate um, the fine print myself. But uh, fortunately, other people, other people do that. Yeah. So I started as a theoretical physicist. Which is still my main inclination. Then, uh, you know, after a few years, I started doing other things for a living. I've done a lot of things. I've been, a, uh, I've been a manager, a bureaucrat, a writer, uh, a hmm. software developer, a consultant in uh, many fields. But you know, this uh, thinking about what I consider the big things right. is and has always been my main interest. Along the way, I got in touch with uh, many interesting people. In the 90s, I discovered uh, this uh, transhumanist community on the internet. And uh, of course, I became uh, immediately a Kat Kerring member. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't call myself a transhumanist anymore. I prefer to call myself a cosmist. But that is uh, a very major intellectual influence. And uh, among the people I met were uh, Martin and uh, the TSM people. Sure. And so one of the meetings that I try to attend each month is the monthly TSM gathering. And uh, we've met before at these meetings. By the way, mm -hmm. uh, let me say that my own worldview is very much compatible with uh, TerraSAM. We just emphasize uh, different things, but uh, different things uh, that are uh, compatible to each other. Sure, yeah. Yeah, awesome, yeah. That was an awesome answer. Um, yeah, I have like really appreciated like your presence in the meetings and uh, like colloquiums. You're like an awesome host, um, and you know your yeah your your answers are just like great to some of those big questions like you mentioned. Um, maybe we can hop around a little bit. Um, oh sure. Yeah. So I listened to your presentation about the possible maybe beginning point and end point uh, of the of the universe possibly and um i've asked you some questions about uh, certain topics and one of them that i'm curious about is uh, maybe um kind of you talked about quantum archaeology before um and i'm very curious about um, the possibility of future civilizations and what they could, what 
could be possible, what they could do in the future, and could they affect the past? Uh, could they view the past? Could they time travel back in the past? If they could time travel, where are they? Or if they, if people have done that, why don't we see them? Or this could also be some kind of timeline issue of like, if we are kind of the, the base uh, timeline, then those future eventualities haven't existed yet. Uh, but if they were to exist, then why haven't we seen some evidences of that in the past? So do you have any ideas about yeah, let's, kind of general uh, Yeah, let's question? start with, uh, let's start with this last point. Uh, do you have children? I do not, no. You do not. Uh, well, uh, do you hope to have children one day? <laughs> yes, some kind of right. children, yes. So uh, when you will have children, you will uh, experience something that uh, every parent has experienced, which is, uh, you know, sneaking in the living room on the night before uh, Christmas to leave the Santa Claus uh, presents to your kids. Um, and uh, the question is, why haven't your kids seen you? instead of Santa Claus bringing uh, the presents. And of course, the answer is that uh, you prefer not to be seen by them. So that uh, you go do that at uh, a time in the night uh, when they are asleep. Or at least uh, the probability that they are not asleep is low. And uh, I think we are uh, facing uh, pretty much uh, the same uh, question here, another example is uh, what we do when uh, a team of uh, anthropologists go and study some uh, remote uh, culture in the middle of the jungle. They uh, go to great lengths to minimize their impact. Uh, perhaps they want uh, the subjects of their study to see only the things that uh, they want uh, to let them see. And you yeah. know, when you talk of uh, very advanced civilization, but very advanced with uh, the word very underlined, we are talking of uh, you know capabilities that are uh, really orders of magnitude beyond what we can even imagine. And so that uh, you know, I assume that um, if they don't want to be seen by us, they would not be seen by us. And uh, when I discuss the Fermi paradox, I usually say, well, okay, how do you know that they are not right here, right now, perhaps watching okay. you from uh, behind your shoulder in a way that uh, you could never see? I think uh, it must be, it must be something like that. Now, um, what can very advanced uh, civilizations do, of course, we do not know. Because, you know, they would not be very advanced if we could understand them. That's, right. kind, of the, that's kind of the definition of very advanced. Um, but um, uh, the question what they could not do is, uh, Another interesting part of the question, and my own answer is that uh, you know anything that we can imagine, they could do. Yeah, including time travel. Now, uh, if you go and study contemporary physics, you see that you know well, uh, time travel is one of those things uh, that um, scientists often prefer to not even talk about because uh, you know they could be mistaken from science fiction fans you know a scientist especially a young one has to be very careful of what they say in order not to jeopardize their career you know when they grow older and maybe win a Nobel Prize they become uh, much less cautious than that and yeah. the people like uh, Kip Thorne, 
won the Nobel Prize for the first discovery of gravitational waves. You know, he has written books about the possibility of time travel. Of course, he doesn't say, yes, time travel is possible, but, you know, he, uh, he says it with uh, many qualifications, of course, but what he says and what uh, many other contemporary scientists say is that what we know about how the universe works does not rule out the possibility to travel in time, even backwards. And as a matter of fact, uh, Kurt Gödel, the mathematician and logician, was one of the first, perhaps the first, to find solutions to Einstein's field equations of general relativity that uh, describe uh, backward directed time travel. Uh, the solutions are correct. There are many solutions of this kind. Uh, things like uh, wormholes uh, connecting uh, different places at different uh, times are uh, a quite uh, firm mathematical conclusion from uh, general relativity. And of course, uh, when we go to quantum physics, things uh, become uh, much weirder and even more interesting than that. So on the basis of what I know at this moment, and on the basis of what I understand of uh, the work of uh, frontier uh, contemporary scientists, only thing I can say is that I cannot see any reason why future civilizations should not be able to travel in time. I think they will be. Uh, yes, I think they will be able to travel in time. And the answer to the question, why don't we see them, is what I just gave you. You know, Stephen Hawking uh, took the initiative to launch a party for uh, time uh, travelers. Uh, and of course, he announced that after the party. And uh, he wrote about that. He said, well, OK, you know, on Saturday last week, I had uh, a party for uh, time uh, travelers, I invited everyone. Of course, I sent the invitation on Monday the following week. And the fact that nobody came indicates that uh, at least there are no time travelers here and now, but uh, you know, um, his conclusion is wrong because uh, uh, you know, if they didn't go, um, there is the possibility that they didn't go because uh, they didn't know that uh, the party was on, or maybe because there were no time travelers, but the other possibility is that they didn't go because they didn't want to go. And on the basis of what we know, there is no reason to rule entirely out this second possibility. So I think, yes, future uh, scientists will uh, be able to master the physics and the technology of time travel. Don't ask me how. Of course. Uh, I live at the beginning of the 21st century, and so that I don't know. But what I can say is that there are very promising indications that uh, in today's physics that show at least some mental pictures of um, how future civilizations could travel in time. What we can visualize and uh, understand intuitively at this moment is most likely wrong. So I do have uh, many yeah. of time travel in my head and I think they are all wrong. But I also think some future scientists will uh, find uh, something much better than we can in what we can imagine right now. Could it be some kind of case that uh, like some future people wouldn't want to travel back to the past because it may jeopardize the future that they come from. It may change the timeline and may cause some detriment to their future. Um, we see some sci-fi um, movies and things like that where time travelers go back before 
uh, human civilization to not affect human, human civilization. Um, and also another movie that comes to mind is like Interstellar, uh, where, you know, a future civilization um, like creates some kind of um, wormhole um, for uh, like Matthew McConaughey's character to go through and somehow there's some paradox of he's communicating with himself uh, from the future to his past self, but the present self is receiving a message from his future self, which this future civilization has opened up this kind of uh, higher dimensions so he can be able to do that. So yeah, what do you think about that kind of issue of uh, affecting the past, a future civilization not wanting to jeopardize their own timeline by affecting the past. Mm, or could it be a me. part of the story? Well, let me um, first think about uh, what to say and in which order. Sure. Um, I would start saying that uh, traveling in time in the past and uh, doing something does not necessarily mean that uh, you change the future from uh, where you came. Mm, that would be the grandfather's paradox that you go back to when your grandfather was a kid, you shoot him. So since your grandfather is dead before having children, you cannot be here. And this is uh, yeah. the very typical. So the past is also of, their future uh, if they go there. Right. But, uh, you know, um, this is uh, a conclusion of a way of thinking that... Um, is not necessarily entirely correct. I think in some cases it's wrong because you know there can be entirely self-consistent uh, uh, solutions where uh, you go back in time, you do things, and history stays exactly the same until the moment in time you can uh, back from. Perhaps you don't even realize that, but it's kind of like uh, the universe conspires to keep uh, the unique, we are not yet talking of many timelines, uh, to keep the unique timeline self-consistent. And uh, so that uh, in the case of the grandfather's paradox, uh, you know, you go back in time, shoot your grandfather, but the gun doesn't work. Mm, okay, you can say that uh, there is a very low probability that uh, the gun doesn't work. Even uh, you know, perhaps the gun is new. Perhaps you have just uh, checked that the gun works. So you know, okay, it was now you shoot your grandfather again, and the gun doesn't work again. Sometime you give up and go back. This uh, seems like a uh, conspiracy based on a, an event of uh, very low probability, but uh, you know, there is this very interesting book by Robert Forward that I recommend that you read if you are interested in these things. The title of the book is uh, Indistinguishable from Magic. He has also written a science fiction novel based on uh, his idea on time travel, which is called Time Master. And here, the idea is that uh, things that have uh, a very low probability can become very highly probable in the uh, presence of the closed time-like uh, trajectories that uh, enable time travel. So you shoot your grandfather many times, and the gun never works that would be something that happens with a very low probability in most cases. But in this particular case, is something that happens with 
probability one, because you know the GAN doesn't work because it cannot work. And it cannot work because if it does work, then you could not be firing it. And yeah. uh, this uh, is a completely self consistent solution. Mm, I mean, mm, uh, you go back to the past, you do things, but you don't change the timeline. In passing, before saying something else, let me mention another time travel uh, paradox, which is the information paradox, which uh, I like to formulate in this way. And so I go back in time, right? And I meet William Shakespeare. And uh, I, uh, I give William Shakespeare uh, a copy of Hamlet, the copy that I have uh, brought with me. And uh, mm -hmm. what does he do? He copies the te text and he publishes uh, Hamlet himself. And so that is Hamlet. So the question is who wrote Hamlet? Uh, did I write it? No, I didn't write it because I read it on a book of Shakespeare. Did Shakespeare write it? No, because he copied it from a book that I gave to him. So this looks like a paradox, but you know, if you go to watch what happens in the loop is entirely safe consistent. Uh, consistency is not broken anywhere. So that, you know, the information paradox uh, is not really a paradox in my opinion. And, uh, you know, who wrote Hamlet? In uh, this scenario, the universe wrote Hamlet. Hamlet always existed and uh, it came uh, to be in our uh, reality in this uh, very convoluted uh, self consistent uh, time loop way. And I do suspect that, uh, you know, our universe, our reality is full of self consistent time loops. Uh, the fabric of reality is really made of these loops. And uh, here again, I can just say it in this uh, poetic way, but I'm sure that uh, future scientists will uh, understand these things much better than me. And there are already some indications. Um, you know, there is the... Let's go back to Kip Thorne. He and some collaborators made uh, this um, series of uh, Gedanken experiments with uh, billiard balls going into wormholes. Thing is that you know you have uh, a billiard ball that uh, enters one of the two mouths of a wormhole and comes out of the other mouth from here to here at an earlier time. And uh, since the billiard ball has gone backwards in time, it can collide with its uh, former self, right? So here you have the balls that went through here, but it comes down from here, hits its former self, and it uh, knocks it uh, uh, on a path where it would not enter the one hole. That's the, uh, this version of the grandfather's paradox. But you know, the, what uh, Thorne and collaborators found is that there are many entirely self consistent solutions to this uh, scenario. Uh, you know, the billiard ball always goes into the wormhole as it was supposed to. It's never knocked, of course. The difference uh, from our intuitions is that instead of one solution to the essentially classical mechanics uh, problem of the, what happens to the billiard ball, Instead of one solution, there are many. So um, they did not find a way 
to create the grandfather's like paradox, but they did find a way to show that uh, classical mechanics, which uh, is uh, usually thought of something very much deterministic, becomes non-deterministic in uh, presence of uh, time travel along uh, closed time-like curves. Instead of one solution, have many solutions. So this is just one more uh, argument in support of the idea that uh, grandfather's like paradoxes would not happen because the solution has to be self-consistent, whatever happens. And uh, self-consistency itself enforces that. Now, all that in a single timeline. Now, mm -hmm. uh, what I imagine is that uh, the universe always does its best to keep everything self-consistent in one timeline. Uh, but sometimes there is nothing that can be done. And in these cases, a new timeline is uh, created. And so we fall back to the standard solution to the grandfather uh, paradox, which is that of saying that, well, okay, you go and shoot your grandfather, your grandfather dies, but uh, it's no big deal because uh, this happens in another timeline, which is not the same timeline in which you went back in time to shoot your grandfather. So what I think is that uh, nature, the universe, does a combination of these two things to enforce self-consistency in uh, time as long as it can be enforced and also creating new timelines when uh, there is nothing else to do. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah, and um, I was thinking too that in the future, um, a civilization that has like time travel capabilities, it may be like highly regulated. Um, and uh, also by, by that civilization, and I think sometimes in movies, we, we like to see like humans doing the time traveling as we kind of know them at this time on earth, where in reality, uh, by the time that that could be figured out, uh, people may not um, be as the way we are now, more of a transhumanist kind of um, thing, right? Integration with digital intelligence and um yeah um just different right um different form different state um and that might scare uh some past civilizations as well to inter to encounter these kind of people not that they might be afraid right um in some sense um so yeah, I, I've thought about that too. Um, yeah, what do you think? But you know, here the Santa Claus argument applies. If they don't want to be seen, <laughs> they will. Uh, they would find a way not to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, well, hmm. in fact. Uh, you no, know, they don't. Right, that, that makes sense. Anything, yeah. They don't even have to do anything explicit not to be seen. Because you know, if you imagine how future very advanced the humans could, could look like, I mean, they uh, uh, is not even necessary that they have a physical body that we can see. Sure. You know, as you know, since uh, Arthur Clarke. Uh, wrote in uh, 2001 the novel that uh, you know the monolith maker where uh, uh, energy creator without a physical body there has been a lot of speculation of you know things like uh, 
thinking uh, blobs of radiation and quantum fields that are entirely undetectable from us. And uh, that's why I say, you know, uh, one of them could be watching us from uh, behind my shoulder right now. <laughs> and we would I think about that, that too often, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, that, that was very beautiful. Um, Okay, so kind of, I'll just keep jumping around. So you've talked about Arthur C. Clarke and um, how can today we appreciate some of these classical writings of, of science fiction for people that are new to some of these you know, great works? What can we maybe glean from them today and, and um, kind of think about life? Um, you know, I feel like that's not talked about much, especially if you watch YouTube or something like that. Um, there's movie reviews and series reviews and, um, yeah, I, I myself have not read a lot of like more like you could say classic science fiction. Um, but I would like to, and I would like to get a sense of, um, your appreciation for them and why you may think they're relevant still today. Yeah, you know, I have uh, grown up reading uh, good science fiction. Um, and I started when I was five and never, never stopped. And I will never stop. So uh, I have uh, a quite good knowledge of uh, classic uh, uh, vintage science fiction because um, you, know, you couldn't uh, have this knowledge because uh, you're younger than me. But, you know, there are some writers who are very much worth reading. And, of course, Arthur Clarke is one. And uh, then, uh, you know, Robert Heinlein, like Heinlein yeah. Clifford Simak. Uh, there are many good writers of uh, classic uh, vintage science fiction. But that means, you know, science fiction written uh, until uh, the 70s, I'd say. Now, the thing is, um, if you read only vintage science fiction, you have the impression uh, that you know, it's much too simple for today's world. Uh, because in the meantime, uh, literature has developed. So um, the impression that you may have reading uh, vintage science fiction is, you know, yes, the science is interesting and the sociological speculations are also interesting, but the human characters are very much underdeveloped. This is one of the flaws of uh, vintage science fiction. Uh, you know, in this respect, today's uh, literature is much more interesting. Uh, I think there are some uh, young writers who combine the best of both worlds. I mean, they are uh, human story, very interesting with the kind of people that you see around you today, not 50 years ago, but at the same time, are able to evoke uh, this uh, cosmic sense of wonder of the best uh, vintage science fiction. There are not many of them, but there are some. For example, uh, there is this uh, science fiction writer who is also a YouTube star called Lindsay Ellis. She has, she must be uh, your age, I guess, between 30. 35, something like that. Mm -hmm. She has written two very good novels called the first is Axiom's End. The second was called The, the Truth of the Divine. You know, they are very good, very much in line with the kind of sensibilities that uh, we see around us today. But, you know, the sense of uh, absolute wonder of the greatest science fiction is there. I look very much for the forward 
to the third book of the series. And you know, there are not many young science fiction writers that they really appreciate, but there are some. This is uh, an example, and uh, there are others too. You know, combining the two things, you know, um, in some sense, uh, our world today is much more interesting than uh, the world uh, where I was a kid. Uh, but we might have the impression that uh, something has been also lost. Uh, think, for example, of the space program. Now, we were mm -hmm. so, so excited with the Apollo program uh, in the 60s. I was very young, but we all imagined, uh, you know, cities on the moon and cities on Mars. Right. Uh, all these things... Uh, all those things did not materialize. Now, when you look around you, you see that people um, are mostly interested in other things. But uh, perhaps uh, I should say are also interested in other things, not mostly, but also, because that you are interested, for example, in uh, uh, climate change or social justice does not mean that you cannot be also interested in uh, space flight and space expansion. Yeah. So since, uh, you know, I like, uh, I like to be optimistic. So, uh, you know, I keep asking myself, okay, why not both? Why not having uh, uh, both the things that make today's world better than 50 years ago, but also the things that, uh, the good things that we had 50 years ago, that uh, we may have the impression that are lost to do, they are not lost, we can have both. Mm -hmm. And the science fiction has an important role to play. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think more of my influences have been some series. Um, I mean, I grew up watching like Stargate, right? The Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, these kind of series or um, the Battlestar Galactica remake. That was really great. So I kind of gravitated more towards uh, series and, and Is the for sure. I have not, no. Ah, no. You, should, uh, you, should, yeah, you should watch that. The, it's really uh, awesome. Yeah, The Expanse is good. The Expanse is very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I just was, yeah, you, you know, have, watching. Uh, yeah. uh, you have my books. Yes, I do, actually. Yeah. Um, the, in particular, the one called Futurist Space Flight Meditations. Mm -hmm. I use uh, the expense to illustrate uh, future uh, 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 possibilities for future interplanetary civilizations, not yet interstellar, you know, expense until when uh, the proto molecule builds the worm. Oh, I shouldn't give you spoilers if you haven't. Seen <laughs> but, sure. um, you know, it's a very well done description of a realistic future human civilization in the social system, in the, in the solar system. Mm -hmm. I love Yeah, it. awesome. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, um, and I think definitely one of my favorite movies of all time is, you know, Alien, um, the classic like 19, I think 79 Alien, um, big fan. Um, no, I didn't yeah. uh, really like it, but you know, <laughs> when uh, you watch, uh, I love the two thousand one, uh, the stylistic, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, too much spoiled for that. You know, when you watch uh, two thousand one, and you are uh, ten years old, uh, wow. you find uh, very difficult to really <laughs> appreciate uh, science fiction yeah. movie for life. I mean, right, had, it's a high uh, bar. Yeah, we had so, so high a bar that you know, science fiction for a film or television, I do like something, for example, The Expanse, but most of what I see, I don't like at all. Because, uh, you know, it's uh, sure. very much below my high bar. 
yeah, lots of cheesy stuff these days. Um, yeah, so kind of to flow into an, another area, but connected still, um, you know, recently there's been, you know, a lot of hype about like chat, GP, GPT-3, 3.5, also some image generation like Midjourney or Dolly, Dolly 2. Also, there's a stable diffusion, uh, which is an open source version of these. Um, and so I've been, you know, experimenting with these and, and, and doing, you know, writing on chat GPT and uh, having a lot of fun with that and also doing image generation. And I think, you know, it's not long before we actually do some, you know, video uh, generation as well. I mean, maybe in 2003, I think. Um, and you mean, so uh, be, you mean yeah. uh, 2030, 2003 was 20 years ago? Uh, 2023, yeah, this year. Uh, 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 yeah. As of now, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I think it's not soon before, uh, you know, there'll be movies, series, um, pretty much whatever you want to watch and whatever creative, creative thing you can imagine. Uh, I think uh, you'll be able to, to watch it. Um, you know, and this is, you know, kind of very interesting development. Um, and it's very cool to see like AI have some role in creativity and art and to see humans respond to that. Uh, you know, a lot of people have thought like, well, human, human beings like on earth, like the imagination has been like maybe our territory or something like that. But to see su such generations in, in, even though it's kind of more um, narrow AI or something like that, uh, it's still really amazing. And, and when I interact with chat GPT, uh, GPT-3 or uh, Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion, it feels like a conversation. It feels like an interaction because I'm asking questions. I'm <clears throat> I'm kind of giving prompts to generate images, and and then I'm getting some communication back, um, you know, some data, some information. So there's some interaction going on. Um, yeah, what have your thoughts been about these recent developments? And do you have any thoughts about creativity or some experiences that you'd like to have or any ideas? Mm, you know, I'm pretty much uh, persuaded that, uh, you know, these uh, things like ChatGPT or uh, DALI or Midjourney uh, are very close to passing the Turing test, which is the standard uh, definition until now of artificial intelligence, meaning that, you know, if it uh, interacts with you, in a way that uh, you cannot uh, distinguish from a human. That means that uh, the artificial intelligence is working. So I think, well, it's arguably, you know, chat GPT passes the Turing test now. Uh, I don't think so because it's still possible, I understand, uh, to trick it uh, yeah. to interacting in a way that is not human, but, uh, you know, this will be fixed in the next iteration, and the next iteration will be even better. So I don't have any doubt that uh, AI systems will uh, not only pass the Turing test, but also become able to do most of what we do much better than us. Even things like, you know, directing a film, uh, creating a game, writing a novel, writing a song. You know, I don't have any doubt that that will happen. Now, will these uh, things be only chatbots or will they be conscious people like you and me? I do think that we will have the, the technology to create uh, conscious AIs one day, but I do not think that's likely to happen very soon. Why not? Because, 
you know, I still think there is a fundamental qualitative difference between uh, a person and a computer that cannot be overcome using uh, conventional computer technology of the kind that, that we have today. Why do I say that? Because I'm kind of persuaded that uh, some new physics is needed to understand how human consciousness works. Um, there are uh, proposals, for example, by Roger Penrose, that uh, whatever it is, it must be related to quantum effects that uh, yeah. play a significant role in the brain. Now, um, if you accept uh, this idea, and if you know how conventional silicon computers work, you see that you know the two things don't go together. Uh, quantum effects would uh, uh, leverage uncertainty, which is exactly the same uncertainty that uh, conventional uh, silicon uh, computers are uh, built in a way to ignore. So if conventional silicon computers ignore, you know, you know, it's a digital bit, it can be one or zero, it cannot be anything mm -hmm. in between. If it is something in between, then it jumps to one or zero immediately. And when it is one, it stays one. It's very robust against uh, uh, fluctuations. So that, uh, you know, I don't think the two things match. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think a lot about this, uh, and I could be wrong, but I had the kind of feeling or hunch that uh, conventional silicon computers will not reproduce uh, human-like uh, consciousness. But uh, then again, when uh, you move to quantum computers, then, uh, uh, the objection that I just raised sees uh, to be valid. And so why not? Could a quantum computer be conscious perhaps? Mm -hmm. Or uh, something built uh, on uh, an entirely different uh, kind of computing technology? So that I think sooner or later we will have human-like uh, conscious artificial intelligence. Do I think so? Yes. When? I don't think next year. I don't think in the next decade. I think we have to wait much longer than that. But in the meantime, uh, narrow AI will make uh, really spectacular advances and you know, become uh, much better than us at doing uh, whatever it is that we do with yeah. uh, a very small set of exceptions that is going to become smaller and smaller in the future. That's uh, the logical outcome of things, I believe. But, uh, you know, so does that, does that mean that uh, now that uh, we know how to build artificial intelligence, there is no room for us in the universe anymore. No, I don't think so. Especially because when you think of evolution, the only thing that I can see and what I would like to see is a co-evolution of human sent technology. At some point, we will build intelligent technology, but we will also, uh, we will also merge with our intelligent yeah. technology and we will evolve together. At some point, uh, you know, for a future person living uh, sometime in the 22nd century, the question, is this a natural human or a machine will not only be unanswerable, but uh, also meaningless, perhaps? Yeah, right. It definitely will make sense at that time. Um, 
yeah it was yeah um it's so interesting because um sometimes i watch these uh, text to image generations and uh, some people create animations of them and when i watch these animations of, of these generations there is this almost psychedelic sense to them or nature to them or this feeling that a human did not make these images it's just too um too dynamic too much information too abstract too diverse um and and that's a very interesting um experience to have to relate to this kind of art or this imagery or this video and i think it, it definitely will change the way we think um you know just in general um yeah yeah, so I'm having a good time with it. Um, you know, I've been having fun just like um, making some images, putting myself into some sci-fi movies, for example, um, because I think in the near future, why not like generate some movie or series and, and add oh, yourself sure. as a character with your your data and your information? How much fun would that be? And, and that, there's uh, something- happen sooner yeah. than we think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's something hopeful about that to me that, wow, if we're able to do this in some kind of digital way, then that's not far from an augmented reality. That's not far from virtual reality versions of this. And I think these experiences are going to feel more and more real. Uh, and just like you said, there's about a um, later civilization not making the distinction between like uh, natural and, mach and machine like person um quote, quote um i think you know it'll be the same too i think we'll both the distinction between the this digital experience and the this biological physical experience will become more integrated and merged as well and so yeah it's very exciting to see you know the beginnings of this yeah or not, maybe we have already seen the beginnings in the late 80s or early 90s where, uh, you know, the internet started uh, taking off and being used by more and more people because it's just a continuation of the same process. Yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about that too. Mm. Cool. Yeah. And uh, like, you know, in fact, uh, speaking of this, this... Uh, is evolution and uh, i don't like to make uh, a distinction between natural evolution and uh, uh, technology driven evolution because you know, i think it's uh, exactly the same we uh, nature makes us we make machines so nature makes machines yeah yeah, exactly. It's going on in the same universe. Um, yeah. So would you like more questions? Oh, sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, just let me know about time. Um, uh, I think yeah. I'll have to go in about 15 minutes from now. But, uh, you know, in 15 mm -hmm. minutes, we can discuss a lot of interesting things. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so... I think it'd be fun. I'd like to know just some of your favorite uh, sci-fi movies or or ones that have really stood out to you in the recent years. Movies. Yeah. Things that, you know, as I told you, most sci-fi movies, I don't really like that much. But uh, especially, I tend to dislike the sci-fi movies made uh, from books. For example, mm -hmm. uh, there are these three great uh, novels by Richard Morgan. The first is called Altered Carbon. They have been made into a TV show, which is also called Altered Carbon, which uh, in my opinion right. is yeah, in my opinion, it's horrible. And, uh, sure. Perhaps not horrible, but uh, the novels were so incredibly much better 
Then yeah. uh, I think they call them sleeves or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for uh, someone who had, has read the novel, the show is unwatchable. And since uh, I do read uh, a lot of science fiction before they make it into a movie, uh, it's very difficult for me to appreciate the movie. What uh, did I like? I told you that I liked uh, The Expanse. Mm. Yeah. Interstellar, uh, mm, I mostly liked it. Uh, I liked Hell. Uh, mm -hmm. That was great. Movie about artificial intelligence of a few years ago. Transcendence, yeah, I also like that one. What yeah. else? Um, You know, not not really much else. You know, I have, uh, in fact, uh, I'm very much interested in uh, this. I wrote uh, recently, wondering, uh, you know, who is making it or who could make uh, the next uh, 2001. Because, you know, that film mm -hmm. had... Um, it an incredibly huge psychological impact on me and so many other people of my generation. If you think, uh, you know, all the um, interesting things that have happened in technology and science in the, next, in the last few decades, you know, the development of internet, biotechnology, space, uh, you know, I'm uh, willing to bet uh, that that very many of the creators of uh, today's world became so interested, got you know this uh, burning interest for science and technology, watching the uh, 2001. So we would really need a contemporary version of 2001. Uh, perhaps you know is. Um, also, you know, it's very difficult to make a good book into a good film. Mm -hmm. There are two completely different things. Uh, I know of very few examples where a filmmaker has uh, really followed the novel that uh, the film was based upon. In some cases, it's just impossible. Uh, so I think the new 2001 perhaps should be made for film first and then maybe adapted for novel or uh, uh, even just a film, it should be good. It should be something so good that uh, stimulates the new generation of people younger than you to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, try to do what uh, we have been trying to do and hopefully with better uh, results. Yeah, definitely. And back to this generative like AI um, conversation, right? I think that, um, you know, I think that really turns people onto technology and makes people happy. I mean, people want to be happy. People want to be entertained. People want to have fun. And um, what better way than, in, than great fiction? And maybe, you know, some AIs are going to be helping you know, make and, that uh, fiction. So, uh, yeah. I, um, you know, thinking aloud, I just had this idea that, uh, yeah. you know, uh, so you ask, uh, why don't you write uh, this novel yourself? And, uh, you know, of course I would like to, but uh, uh, I don't have that kind of creativity. Mm -hmm. Not uh, enough creativity to write a good novel. The thing is that I have not only been reading science fiction, I have been a lot of literature of all genres. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I could not write something as good as uh, the things that I read that I really liked. But, uh, you know, why don't I or someone write a short synopsis of what the next uh, 2001 could be? and give it as input to chat GPT or something like that uh, to write a full novel or a film script. That would be a very cool project, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. And, 
And I think that, um, you know, writing these prompts is, is a real skill. And I oh, think sure. it, it'll become like a skill. And I think for people that have kids now, I mean, you know, giving them homework to write great prompts into a mm. chat GPT yeah. or uh, into an image generator, that's really cool. Yeah, you can um, also ask uh, chat GPT to imitate the, the style of a particular writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's this interesting experience because um, I've been thinking about, you know, what, what makes me unique as a person, my personality, my thoughts, if uh, probably a, a, a chat, you know, chat bot like chat GPT can just output that information, you know, uh, based on my data, uh, that's maybe another conversation. Um, a philosophical one, but um, it, it's, it's just a very, I think it's more transformative than people are aware of right now. Um, eventually, yeah. eventually, yes. Well, although this is uh, still a very early and very young iteration of these technologies, but you know, uh, Chat GPT and uh, Mid Journey, I, and I understand that, that uh, is going to be a GPT-4 next year. And then perhaps the following year it will be GPT-5. Oh, at some point, one of these GPTs will uh, really be transformative. And uh, yes, I do expect that uh, these things will become uh, pervasive and uh, really have an impact. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, really play much with, uh, I mean, I have played with uh, chat GPT, of course, but uh, not as much as other people. I do read the, the reports of other people, so. And uh, yes, this is uh, very certainly a technology to watch. Yeah. yeah and, and maybe, you know, final question or getting close to it. Um, in general, like what, have you been thinking about these days? What has occupied your, your thought life in terms of uh, science, technology, space, humanity? What's your, um, what's your, where's your desires leading you these days? Mm. See, besides uh, the normal desires of everyone, which are always the most <laughs> important thing, meaning that, you know, yes. me, the important thing is that my daughter and my wife and my dog are in good health and happy enough. I also want to be good health and happy myself. I want to eat something good tonight. You know, apart from these things, which are common to us all. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm interested in building uh, uh, bridges between uh, the scientific worldview and uh, what we could call the religious worldview or perhaps the mystical worldview. Mm. You know, if you think of religion, you are thinking of something that uh, over the centuries has done a lot of good to people. It has also done bad things. It has also done very bad things, but it has also done things which are essential to the deep well-being, deep inside of everyone. And for example, all the most people of uh, previous generations, like you know, our grandfathers, they were really persuaded deep down into their bones that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, most of the promises of uh, religions were uh, true. And in particular, the promise of some kind, some form of afterlife or resurrection, that they would see the people they loved again after that. You know, uh, not uh, allowing oneself, oneself to believe this is uh, something really paralyzing, I believe.
yeah if i do have uh, these hopes i don't uh I wouldn't have any reason to get out of bed in the morning. I wouldn't have any reason to try to do some little thing every day to make the world a better place. You know, allowing yourself to believe in some kind of afterlife is essential for well-being. And this has been the force of religion for so many centuries, to offer people a certainty in that. Now. Now we, I mean, uh, we people in the modern world, in the 20th and 21st century, have kind of uh, lost our capacity to allow ourselves to contemplate uh, religious-like eschatology with afterlife. Because uh, on the one hand, we know too much science. And on the other hand, we don't understand our science enough. Because if you really look at what uh, science says, you find that it is not incompatible with hope in uh, afterlife or other uh, promises of religion at all. Not only it is not incompatible, but if you really try to understand science as far as we can understand the things today, you realize that you know uh, it's not going. To, science is not going to explain you how all these things work. Not yet, but you find a lot of hints that uh, you know things uh, that the universe that we live in could be really a magic place where all the promises of religion will eventually come true, perhaps spontaneously, perhaps assisted by our own scientific and technology development. And you mentioned the quantum archaeology at the beginning which is a portmanteau name that we are using for hypothetical future technology able to go back into the past, or at least to acquire enough information from the past to resurrect uh, the dead in the present, which if you think of it is uh, you know, a, a resurrection scenario that uh, for uh, what is really important is equivalent to that offered by religion. And uh, this is what uh, I'm really interested in. This is what I want to do. I want to offer people hope in an afterlife and uh, the happiness that comes with it. Of course, it's not a work that I can do all myself. But uh, I try to give uh, some little contribution to that. Yeah. Um, hmm. I definitely, you know, relate to that deeply. Um, and I, you know, really appreciate like all of your like, contributions. And, you know, it just, you keep producing more, <laughs> which is awesome and, you know, really amazing. Uh, more articles on like turn church website um and you know it's just really awesome um to interact with so i'm very like grateful for all the work that you've done um yeah i mean that very sincerely um, and i'm very grateful to you for saying that because you know one um, needs uh, to know that uh, what one does uh, has a little impact perhaps if i give you something uh, beautiful to hope in or at least something interesting to think about then uh, i have been using my time well mm -hmm. yeah and i think one thing that really motivates me is that um if i if i if there is hope if there's possibility for hope then i have hope i have hope in having hope um there's a chance right um so yeah i'm with you and i'm excited to see like 
you know, what the whole, what the future holds for us and, and the development of all these things. And, you know, I hope that we'll gain more insights over time. Um, yeah, and it's just beautiful experience and I'm really happy to share with you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I will have to go in a little while, but let's stay in touch. Do, uh, will I see you in a few days at the Terrasem meeting? Uh, yeah, of course. I'll be there. That's great. And uh, thank you very much for joining me today.